This particular lunchtime seminar series is made possible through the generous gift of Dr. Ernst and Mrs. Volgino. Dr. Volgino is a 1955 graduate of the Naval Academy, a career Air Force officer. I mean, we still took money from him in spite of that, but he is a, a career Air Force officer. And the founder and chairman of SRA International, a public information technology firm with over 7,000 employees headquarters in Fairfax, Virginia. SRA solves complex problems of global significance in the national security, civil government, and global health fields. We are very grateful for Dr. and Mrs. Volgino's support for this program. They are both just outstanding people and really care about these elements of honor, courage, and commitment. Our guest speaker, Carl Marlantis, is a graduate of Yale University and postponed a Rhodes Scholarship to serve as a Marine officer in Vietnam, where he was awarded the Navy Cross the Bronze Star, two Navy Commendation Medals for Valor, two Purple Hearts, and 10 Air Medals. His first novel, Matterhorn, was over 30 years in the making and examines in a rich and descriptive manner the complexities and ambiguity of war. The book is a New York Times bestseller and has received numerous literary awards since its publication just last year in 2010. Most recently, the Marine Corps Heritage Association presented Mr. Marlantis with their James Webb Award for Fiction. People talk about books that you just can't put down, and I can tell you personally that Matterhorn is one of those books. I found Matterhorn to be riveting, disturbing, and inspiring. Mr. Marlantis masterfully unveils the heart and soul of leaders as they struggle with ethics, professional competence, personal ambition, fear, courage, hate, and love. If you want to understand the inner turmoil a young officer experiences, so for those who are about to become those officers and those of us who work with those who are about to become those young officers, this is a must-read book. It gets at the heart and soul of leadership in a way that I very have rarely experienced in reading over a number of years. So we're honored to have Mr. Marlantis with us this afternoon, and please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Now if I can just find my speech here. Here we go. It's a wonderful pleasure and honor to be here. I'm. Uh, uh, First, first time I've been to Annapolis, and it's, uh, you know, I used to, I used to watch a television show called Annapolis when I was a little kid. And it was about all the the drama of being a midshipman at Annapolis. I don't know how long it lasted, but uh, that was that's been my only my only experience with Annapolis. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Colonel Athens, for for inviting me here, and I also want to thank Marge Ben for taking so much time and effort to set this thing up, and, and Jacqueline D Dana, who also uh, worked on getting all the travel arrangements done. And uh, my, my friend, uh, uh, Admiral Abbott, uh, you know you've arrived when you can come with a driver who's an admiral, so I like that. Um, I thought I'd talk to you today. Uh, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I wrote a whole novel, and it's not just about leadership, but it, it did take a novel to sort of work out what it was about. And, I, and I, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, I was coming up with this speech, is what is the most important thing I can say to particularly the midshipmen who are going to be going out? And so if you haven't gone into food coma from your, from your uh, dessert, I'm going to start off with what I think is the most important thing. My villains, if you haven't read the book, are, are two, a colonel and his operations officer, a, a lieutenant colonel named Simpson and an operations officer whose name is Blakely. And they're not bad people. What they suffer from is ordinary human flaws. One of them drinks too much, and one of them is a little bit too ambitious. And who in this room, you know, hasn't had too much to drink at some time in their life? And certainly, who is in this room isn't ambitious? I mean, you don't get to the Naval Academy unless you're ambitious. And these, these, these two villains just exhibit one of the things that I think you have to just take in, which is that the military is an organization like every other in the sense that 
it is run by ordinary human beings, including you. And every one of these ordinary human beings will have flaws. The major difference is this. If you have, if you're a little bit ambitious or if you drink too much the night before, you know, some reports do and you're working for Microsoft or you're at, you're at the public school district, you know, maybe it's a penny per share on the bottom line or maybe somebody gets demoted or promoted unfairly. But these very same little human flaws kill people in combat. And so you think to yourself, well, what's the answer? I won't make any mistakes. Unfortunately, that isn't the answer, because you will make mistakes. Robert E. Lee made a horrible mistake at Gettysburg. Longstreet told him. He still made the mistake, one of the finest generals that this country's ever produced. You're going to, you're going to mess up. And so what is the actual issue here? You've chosen a profession where ordinary human flaws have enormous, enormous consequences when you're at war. You know, we try to shore up these human flaws with things like honor codes, uh, with uh, impeccable attention to detail. You know, make sure your beds can have quarters bouncing off of them. I mean, this isn't done because, you know, it's, it's just hazing. This is done because impeccable attention to detail is one of the things that when you're tired, you don't want to do. And I can tell you personally, I mean, I had a, a, an incident um, where we had been out on an operation for f about 40 days, and I was really tired, and we had set up on a hilltop, and uh, we hadn't had any sleep. I had lots of excuses, and one of the things that happened is that I got left with the company because, uh, with the company mortar squad, it was, I had a, a rifle platoon, and uh, we were trying to keep the lines, uh, uh, we were trying to pretend that we were a company, so we were staying up late, and I didn't inspect the mortars because I said, well, you know, the squad leader for the mortar, you know, he can inspect the mortars. We got hit, and so we used our mortars to try and uh, take out the, uh, uh, they, they were actually probing one of our LPs. First round went in the right place, the second round hit the LP. Uh, and I can remember this day, you know, seeing the, the kids, you know, coming up the hill with uh, one of them with his brains in the side of his, of his jungle cover. What was wrong? Well, there was, there was the, the base plate on the mortar had gotten loose over 40 some days of combat. And uh, when the first round went out, it went in the right place, but then it kicked back. So the second round went short. Now what do you do? Well, you feel bad about it for the rest of your life. And, that's, and that is going to happen. Why are these two villains really villains? They're really villains, not because they suffer from these flaws, it's because they're unconscious of these flaws. The most important thing that you can do is to recognize that you're going to make mistakes and you are flawed. You're not a genius, you're not uh, you know, faster, quicker, smarter, you're just going to have to recognize that. But in recognizing it, you will save a lot of lives. Because what happens with Blakely and with, with Simpson, Blakely is a very competent uh, uh, operations officer. Simpson's brave, but they're unaware of their flaws. And so people suffer because of this. So if I can leave you with one of the most important lessons that I learned from leadership, it's that accept that you're human, but, ex but focus on becoming conscious of what your humanity is all about. And part of your humanity is the fact that you're not perfect. You can get away with not being that reflective in civilian life. You can get away with it in the military, but it's going to be at the expense of dead people. So I urge you to constantly be aware of it. And one of the things that I always remember a physicist friend of mine, he's very much into Karl Popper, who's a, he's a, a philosopher about uh, how humans learn. And the theory, which I, I buy, is that we learn by having some idea in our head uh, called a theory. It's this sort of science. And then we have to disprove it. You never, you never learn if someone tells you. You know, I mean, you wish you did, but you don't. You have to sort of prove it for yourself. So what, what, the way you prove it is you basically make mistakes. So in order to get smart, I urge you to make as many mistakes as you can as fast as possible. 
because that's the way you're going to get smart. So don't worry about it. On the other hand, if you don't want to live with that kind of responsibility, I suggest you're in the wrong profession. I think the next thing that I would want to focus on about leadership is that the journey that the, that the hero makes, or I should say the protagonist, his name is, is uh, Wayne O'Malis, he starts out being worried about what other people will think of him. He's afraid to ask questions because he'll look stupid. He, he suffers from the same flaws that probably a whole lot of you people have, and I certainly had. I was afraid to ask questions because I didn't want to look stupid. And in the very beginning of the novel, there's a, uh, an incident with, which I won't go into in detail, but where, where uh, one of his squad leaders is, has, a, has a terrible wound and uh, has to be take, uh, medevaced. And what Mellis is trying to think about is who can replace him. Now, this is something that every manager has to think about. Nothing wrong with that. Over the course of this novel, what happens with Mellis is that he begins to move from a position where he looks at things from his point of view to where he looks at things from other people's points of view. He moves from being self-oriented to being other-oriented. And believe me, you can tell when you get an officer, you get a leader who's in front of you, you can tell very, very quickly whether this person has put the mission and his people in front of his, in front of his own career and even his own life and safety. This is what tells, and this is something, again, that you don't just, you're not just born with this. You don't, you don't just learn this overnight. You learn it the hard way, and again, I'm, I'm telling you that you've got to learn it fast. The faster that you change from being self-oriented to being other-oriented, the better leader you're going to be, the better you'll get your mission done with losing less people. But you know, it's no, rose, it's no rose garden. What finally happens in the end with Mellis is that there's two incidences, and I, I use these two incidences because the first incident is as a, a, a kid from his uh, platoon is uh, trapped under a machine gun fire. And Mellis likes this kid, and he wants to pull him out from underneath the machine gun fire. These are all altruistic reasons. But he also wants to get a medal. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to get a medal. I mean, I wanted to get a medal, but you have to understand something about your motives. If you are motivated personally, and you do exactly the same thing in the novel, what happens is he pulls this kid out from underneath the machine gun, and the kid dies. And it could have been because Mellis put a bullet into him. He doesn't know because he was f crawling uphill and trying to, trying to fire. And I had an incident in my own career where I, uh, to this day, don't know whether I killed one of my own guys or not, trying to rescue him. When you have a, an incident that's motivated personally like that in any way, and it goes wrong, it's going to be way harder to live with it than if you do it the way he got his second medal. And his second medal is written in juxtaposition with this first one. The whole platoon is, is in terrible trouble. And at that point, he realizes that unless somebody stands up and moves, they're all going to die. And he performs this action completely altruistically. And this is his character arc. This is where he moves through the novel. And again, you don't get there overnight. I don't know if, you know, I don't think I got there. Luckily for me, I took you know, almost four decades to write this book. So what Mellis learns in the novel, and three months. I took me three decades to learn, so I wouldn't feel too bad about it. But I'm just trying to tell you that, that, that you have um, a lot of learning to do with you and to do ahead of you, and it's very important that you focus on all the things they teach you in leadership classes. These are all very important. But the inner work, the inner work, who am I, where, where do I fall short, 